my entry point to horror films was horror fiction, actually, horror literature. I think, um, you know, like many of my generation, I started on Fear Street. R.L. Stein, I started on Fear Street. I was a little bit too old for Goosebumps when that came out. But first there was Fear Street, which was a really teen uh, slasher book series, kind of a YA book series. And that was an entry point to Stephen King. And I devoured Stephen King books, um, even though I was pretty young, like junior high. I remember I had to ask my mom to uh, write a note to the library to let me take them out to go into the horror section. And I would just devour those big, thick, pulpy Stephen King books. And then I started watching the movies that were based on those books. And uh, and that's when it started. What were some of your favorite King books? Oh, man, I fell in love with The Shining real quick, right away. And I know Stephen King doesn't love it, but I love it. I think he actually improved upon the source material. Don't tell Stephen. Um, uh, it was also hugely foundational for me. I think um, for a lot of youngsters who came to Stephen King, it's, uh, you know, the fact that there are kids beset with these monsters and kids who are afraid and kids who are facing adversity and kids being brave. That one really resonated with me. Who are some of your, your favorite horror authors currently writing? Uh, currently, I'm big into uh, Nick Cutter. Um, Paul Tremblay, I've been reading some of his fiction. Um, Grady Hendrix. Yeah, Paul's a good guy. I'm good friends with him, and I can't get enough of his stuff. Are from... you? Oh, my God. Head yeah. Full of Ghosts. I, I, I listen to audiobooks primarily because I'm so busy. Head Full of Ghosts made me ugly cry out on the street. I was walking my dog, and people were probably walking by thinking, oh, this poor girl just got her heart broken or something. And I was like. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite of his will um, No Sleep to Wonderland and um, The Harlequin in the Train. Mm. those are ones that i i've re i've probably read each of those two or three times each like wow. i can't i can't get enough of paul's stuff yeah i mean i love uh i love daniel Krauss too i've chatted with him a couple of times mm -hmm. since the living dead came out and I'm, I'm still making my way through that one it's a it's a monster yeah i i, I like books that are like tomes man i i want a big heavy book to dive into because i know there's going to be meat on the bone and it's not gonna it's not gonna be gone in a day and a half although sometimes they are yeah right <laughs> Um, I'm curious, what uh, were some of the earliest uh, publications, horror pu or genre publications that you encountered? That I encountered? Or, yeah, or just enjoyed? I mean, huh. I, I was an early adopter of the internet, but mostly uh, in, the, in the social media sense. Um, let me think, some publications. So I, I feel like there were definitely blogs. Like there, there was a blog called The Final Girl, uh, Stacey Ponder's blog. And I remember her mixture of um, personal application and a fan appreciation uh, really spoke to me. And, uh, and it was really inspiring. Um, obviously, publications like Rue Morgue, Fangoria, those were those were available to me. But I also felt I also felt something of a distance to them because as print periodicals, they were focusing on um, mostly on what was new and what was current. And I think it was only later in my post-secondary studies when I was doing my master's in sociology that I was looking at the sociology of horror films. And uh, that's actually what brought me to George. And you, you said the new, they were focusing, what era are we talking about when, when they're focus, focusing on new product? Uh, what, are you asking how old I am? Like, I'll No, I'm trying not to, <laughs> but uh, I... I... <laughs> <laughs> we're talking late 90s. Okay, gotcha. We're talking late 90s, which, you know, some people say was um, was a bad decade for horror i'm inclined to disagree because i was a teenager in the late 90s and that's you know those were teen movies they were they were geared for me they were aimed at me and uh, in retrospect they spoke to my reality so what movies were you watching in the late 90s or in the 90s as a as a teenager uh well like i said i devoured all the stephen kingery and it was just kind of you know vhs was out uh for the most part, but I was, I was still renting movies a lot. And there was a pretty good video store in my neighborhood. And uh, I didn't have any friends who liked horror movies. And I think that's why online, I really gravitated to the social media. I really wanted to connect with other horror fans. You know, from a really early age, I realized that the best way to get a hold of the very best horror was 
you know, through a community. And that's uh, that's what uh, Fangoria and Rumorg offered as well. It's like a conspiratorial conversation between friends of like where to get the good stuff and the VHS swaps and stuff like that. So yeah, in the late 90s, you know, I was seeing the new stuff in the cinemas, but I was also scouring the racks for the uh, uh, the most breathtaking covers, you know, and the, the greatest covers d didn't always yield the greatest movies. Um, case in point, I put Jack Frost on the cover of the November, December issue of Rue Morgue. Like you can't think of that movie and not think about that DVD, uh, that VHS cover with the lenticular design. You can't not. And it's the snowman skull that's not even in the movie. Um, but I can remember them in my, I can picture the cover for Halloween. I can picture the cover for like Dr. Giggles, Hellraiser, uh, Child's Play 2 when he's got the big shears. So was that resurgence, that uh, mid to late 90s resurgence, was that, you know, kind of your launching point that kind of made you look back or, or had you been into it prior to that? No, I think I think starting to look back on older stuff, older stuff that wasn't Stephen King and wasn't a lurid uh, VHS cover at the video store uh, came later when I was in university and I started connecting with other horror fans. And they're the ones who kind of directed me off the beaten path into uh, the works of George Romero, um, Evil Dead, um, J-horror, stuff like that. That's when that started to come into my life. And, you know, I think any young horror fan, you know, like, just give me a list. All you want in life is a list that you can just go through and educate yourself. And of course, that was also, um, that was also when the internet had really found its footing in terms of piracy. And so everything was at my fingertips. It's a great time to be a horror fan. Maybe not a great time to be a, a movie distributor, but it was good for me. <laughs> so, Talk about your introduction to George Romero. What what do you think of when you hear his name? Oh boy. I mean, my connection to George is is he was foundational to my career. You know, I had seen all of his zombie movies. And when I was doing my master's degree in sociology in Ottawa, I um there was a resurgence of um of zombie movies. 28 Days Later had come out and the remake of Dawn of the Dead. And I remember looking at those movies and thinking, huh, these movies are fundamentally different from the classic zombie lore. And so I started uh, I started reading into that and I discovered that, you know, George was largely responsible for the westernized zombie as we know it. And so studying in sociology, I took that a step further to look at um uh, pre-Romero zombie lore in cinema and you come across stuff like I walked with a zombie white zombie the original uh, Haitian voodoo origins it brought me to Wed, uh, Wade Davis Wade Davis's research on um, on zombification in Haiti and then I wrote my master's thesis on how George bringing the zombies to America so to speak turning them into cannibals making them contagious and then this largely uh, subversive plot line of Night of the Living Dead that is situated right into hometown America and was so, so subversive. And the fact that it uh, fell into the public domain and it was on TV all the time. A lot, a lot of people saw this film. So um, so that film to me is, is really singular and really foundational and indeed like the launching pad to my entire career. Not only did I wrap up that thesis uh it was published into a book in uh 2012 i believe and um and yeah that's sad uh, it's pretty much what got me on the uh the course that led me to where i am now and like my school actually if you want some show and tell my school actually gave me like a nice hardcover bound copy of my um master's thesis and when i first moved to toronto george had just uh, immigrated here or like he had become a Canadian citizen or something. There was some like landmark moment in him becoming Canadian. And so there was a surprise impromptu zombie walk that he appeared at um, in downtown Toronto. And I showed up and I brought this and I caught him on his way out and he signed it. Oh, you can't see that at all. There it oh, is. There it is. You see it? Stay scared. Mm -hmm. oh, That's too cool. awesome. That. <laughs> I had to devote several chapters of my thesis to just defending, analyzing film 
in a cultural way, you know, before I even kind of got into the films, which is why I think it's kind of a crappy book. Um, <laughs> I don't super recommend it. I think people pick it up expecting it to just like dive right into zombies. But no, I have to talk about like cultural materialism and uh, cultural production and like all that nerdy stuff that you might enjoy. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll have to send you a copy. Do you know, I get so many pitches for the magazine of people. Uh, if I say try to repurpose, that sounds like that sounds like I don't know. That sounds a little bit disparaging, but 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 like you, they 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 get really excited about the content. They get really inspired by horror movies, and they have some like analytical, academic slant to it, and um, and they pitch me on it. But um, it's such an interesting time in that Rue Morgue has a very specific tone and purpose and place, and I like to think of it as somewhere between horror academia. It has the rigor of horror academia without all the bullshit citations and dead old white men. And you can actually state your opinion without citing everybody. But it's not quite as casual as a blog, per se, or something that you would see on social media. And I think the trickiest thing um, about uh, finding features for Rue Morgue is finding finding that balance in between, because it's something that like even journalism students struggle with that. I get bloggers, I get journalism students, and I get academics, but uh, writing for Rue Morgue is kind of a, a gray space in between all of those disciplines. Um, that encompasses all the strengths of all three, in my view. Yeah. Why do you think horror gets a lot of love in terms of the academic or the the deconstruction? Like, What is it about horror that you feel that a lot of people love to dive into and see what's under the surface? I consider horror to be uh, the most cerebral. I think, you know, um, if you want to think about what makes people laugh, I mean, I can, a loud fart is going to make me laugh. You know what I mean? Scaring people. I mean, you can startle them, but really scaring them, really scaring them on a level that makes them think is, um, is a cerebral process. And it's a, it's an art form. And indeed, I think, part of what I love about horror movies is wondering why this scares me. Why is this unsettling? Why is this um, deviant? Why is this abnormal? And it's in, in asking those questions that, uh, that I better understand uh, myself and what scares me versus what scares other people and how people experience the world differently. Uh, I think that's all tied up in being scared. Upon, you know, gradual or, you know, achieving your master's degree and departing college, was it your goal to enter the realm of genre publication? Uh, was that, you know, your target? Uh, no, no. I, um, I think anyone who <laughs> does like graduate school is just kind of like, I need some money. <laughs> I am sick of craft dinner. I am ready to start living my life. And so I did what many sociology grads do, like a, the sociologist uh, graveyard where sociologists go to die. I got into market research. Um, so it was like statistical analysis to help brands sell things better. And um, and I did that for several years. And uh, on the side, I, I participated in my subcultural interests. I played roller derby and I started up a uh, horror lecture series called the Black Museum with Paul Korup here in Toronto. And we had, um, you know, just experts. There's a lot of horror people living in Toronto. So we would just have experts come in and do a, a lecture on a topic of their choosing. I remember our very first lecture was um, Vincenzo Natale. He came and did a lecture on architecture and film and he showed us all these storyboards from Cube. It was cool. Uh, I did a lecture um, based on my master's thesis. Uh, I think we also had another zombie lecture that um, that took things in a bit of a different direction. But yeah, I always looked at uh, stuff I was doing in horror as a hobby. Um, I definitely reached out to Rue Morgue, but of course they were not. And we are never really uh, hiring staff positions. That's not really like how you get into a place like Rue Morgue. Basically, I started looking at Rue Morgue as an institution in the city that was almost like um, a clubhouse. Like there was a magazine, obviously, that I would love to write for it and work for it and get paid. But moreover, Rue Morgue offered um, community 
There were events, there were screenings once a month. There was the Festival of Fear, which was the horror component to Fan Expo, which is a huge, huge, huge fan convention here in Toronto. And, um, you know, they were always looking for volunteers. They were always looking for help. And I was really eager to connect with other horror fans. So um, so I found my tribe, so to speak, with Rue Morgue. And, um, you know, by the time my time was up with... Um, Market research room org was looking for a receptionist, so I did that for several years, and then uh, and then I became an editor. So uh, horror for me really started as a hobby, and I think it it would have it would still be that way if I were doing something else for a living. I'd still be doing it to a lesser extent on the side. I'm sure of it. So how do you go from receptionist to editor? Like, what was that that process? <laughs> I mean, you would have to ask Rodrigo about that decision-making process because, um, you know, being receptionist for Rue Morgue is kind of, um, it's a tricky gig because you want to have the, 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 the knowledge and appreciation of a fan. You want to have that passion for horror because it wasn't always an easy job. It wasn't always the most glamorous, highest paying job, right? You had to care about the magazine uh, to do that job and, and really take care of our readers and care about the institution. And um, yeah, I think I, you know, I, I was working reception and on the side, I was still doing black museum. I was also doing a podcast, the faculty of horrors, my, um, my horror podcast that I do with another lapsed academic. Um, Alexandra West is my partner in it. And she is, uh, she has a master's degree in theater. So we come at horror from very different viewpoints and we've been doing that podcast for about eight years. And so I think, I suspect, again, you'd have to ask Rodrigo, but I think I had demonstrated that, um, that I was inspired and that I was driven and I accumulated a little bit of a following through the podcast. And I, I guess it was just a, a direction he thought he'd like to take the magazine. So faculty of horror, you started that, I'm guess I'm doing the math. That's, roughly 2013. Um, tell me a little bit about that. What's the format and, uh, and how has that, has that changed at all over the course of, uh, of doing the podcast? Well, the format of the podcast, uh, it emerged really organically. And I think there's something really pure about that. There's something really special about that. And I think that's partly a function of getting on the podcasting train back when it was new, back when it was nascent. And, uh, and, and also partly due to my kind of philosophy of not, not staying in my lane, but not looking at what everyone else is doing, you know, like I don't listen to a whole lot of other podcasts. I don't read a whole lot of magazines because I don't really want them uh, affecting uh, my creative vision, uh, <laughs> if I can put it so uh, embarrassingly. Um, but Alex and I had both been guests on the Rue Morgue podcast. And uh, when we realized that it was just, you know, a computer and a couple of microphones and some free editing software. That's all you needed to make a podcast. We were like, well, let's give it a shot. You know, uh, there weren't a whole lot of horror podcasts. There definitely weren't a whole lot of women hosting horror podcasts. And so we got, we used, it, it was my rock band mic. It was a USB rock band mic for my Xbox 360. And we used to sit on my couch and talk and we'd pass it around back and forth. And when that got to like, poppy um I, I wrapped a sock around it and then when our plosives got too bad i made a screen with a nylon so it was just like hosiery and this usb thing and uh yeah that's that, that was our humble beginnings so the format of the show is we start with um a synopsis of the movies. We say right off the bat that uh, that it's a spoilery podcast. You don't want to go into this podcast without having seen the film. And uh, we mentioned that right off the bat. And each episode is about an hour and a half long and they tackle one, sometimes two, sometimes three films at a time, uh, depending on if they're um, thematically connected or how much we have to say on a given film. So it starts with a synopsis. We describe the film. We enter uh, some sound clips and stuff. Then we usually begin our discussion with um, with some personal reflection of how did you come to this film? Uh, how did you receive it the first time you saw it? How did it speak to you? And then we'll pull out some theory that's relevant to it. So um, 
let's see, I'm trying to think of an example. We just put out an episode on the invitation. Uh, have you guys seen that? No, not yet. Oh, it's fantastic. You must. It was on Netflix for the longest time. I don't know if it is anymore, but whatever in the world they want to charge you to rent it, I, I can't recommend it enough. But it's about okay. a dinner party that uh, that goes really bad. So in Faculty of Horror, you know, we talked about dinner parties. We talked about grief. We talked about, I'm trying not to spoil it, but, um, but yeah, basically whatever... Uh, analytical threads we can tease out we discuss it and we apply it to the films and then in the show notes for every episode we include the readings in case people want to read further so the mandate for the podcast was to take our frankly fucking useless master's degrees in sociology and theater and put them to good use talking about something that we love so so that's that's where my academic my hard academic rigor comes in I wanted to, uh, before we moved on too far, you you kind of teed us up earlier with uh, your introduction to George A. Romero. Talk about that a little more and just how, you know, his, we'll talk about how you initially discovered him and then just how he set you on your path. I'm trying to think about how, I, I, I'm fairly certain that I stumbled upon Night of the Living Dead late at night watching TV at my parents' house. And uh, I, I it, it was about halfway in, but Night of the Living Dead is one of those movies that'll grab you at about halfway in. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter when you tune in. The tension in that house, you can see exactly what's going on. You can see the players and, you know, uh, Dwayne Jones is just, he just commands your attention. He commands all the authority in that house and you're watching and you're like, oh God, what is going to happen to this guy? And then... You see what fucking happens to this guy, and it's devastating. Um, so I can't quite remember in which order I saw the films. I think I actually saw them in order, I suspect, that it would be night and then dawn and then day. And those are the three movies that I covered in my thesis. And uh, and, and, and so after that, you know, I saw them as, uh, as they came out, I guess. And um, what drew me to Romero's films was I felt like they I, I feel like all great horror films hold up a really ugly mirror and you see a reflection of yourself that uh, that maybe you don't quite like and I feel like George's films especially that mirror is very unflinching and it's also really broad it's like he's not he's not indicting white people he's not indicting Americans he's indicting humanity and i see in his films a call for revolution and i think um i think these are really powerful themes and there are so many processes at work that make us feel helpless in our day-to-day -day lives that make us feel like mindless automatons that make us feel like the living dead and through his stories we see that yeah like this is why we feel that way this is these are the parallels between zombies and the living people when there's no more room in hell this is exactly where we are and um and yeah i think that's uh it feels like a call to action more so than uh texas chainsaw massacre you know once you got introduced to george what what of his non-zombie films really stood out to you or surprised you that you you liked more than maybe you thought you would? Uh, you know, I saw The Amusement Park recently and I was like, I don't know if this is a horror film because I was working on I was working on a feature for Garf for uh, for Rue Morgue and I was like, I don't know if this is a horror movie. And then judging by the pit in my stomach <laughs> at the end of it, I was like, oh, yeah, this is a fucking horror movie and it's scary as shit. <laughs> Uh, Martin is great. The crazies. Um... Yeah, what else? Go ahead and say it, Matt. <laughs> Bruiser. It. Bruiser. Haven't seen it. Okay. We'll, we'll round up again in the future. I, I, <laughs> All right. I, yeah, I know. Matt, everybody. Depressed. Have a great time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, Eric likes to joke. I, I have a soft spot for Bruiser, so I always ask everybody yeah. if they've seen it. So, and I'm I'm kind of a closet uh, season of the witch guy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I think uh, season of the witch is on Tubi, but uh, not. 
I don't think Bruiser is. Bruiser is kind of uh That's that's always the oddball. It 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 pops up from time to time on like Amazon Prime and mm-hmm. stuff and it's it it really is probably one of the films that does not get seen. Actually, it looks like it's on Vudu and Tubi for free. There you go. Yeah, but, it, no, but as far as uh, social commentary, both Season of the Witch and uh, Bruiser are just loaded to the gills. I mean, they're mm-hmm. they're, they're worth they're definitely worth seeing. I, I'd love to hear your opinion uh, when you when you do see them. Okay, I, I don't think George can help it. I don't think, um, and, and I've I've noticed throughout my career that he always seems kind of bemused. Like I'll never forget when I ran up to him, this little bright eyed. You signed my Hogwarts <laughs> thesis. I wrote it on your movies. He was like, "Why?" He was like, "You know, he wasn't rude, but he was just kind of like, fuck, uh, all these people turning out because I'm Canadian now. What the fuck is wrong with you? Go live your lives, you know." Um, and then I, another time I saw him in Toronto was the launch of Lollipop Chainsaw. Do you guys remember that um, that video game that came out oh. and? I don't, mm-hmm. I can't remember how he was involved, but the only photo I have with myself and George is me and him and this cosplayer dressed like a cheerleader. And I hate that she's in this photo. Nothing against cosplayers or influencers, but what the fuck. So, you know, he's at, at that point, he was such an icon that he was coming out to like these press things and always just kind of like, what is going on? How am I the godfather of this bonkers pop culture movement, this fan culture movement that zombies are as popular as fucking Pokemon? Like, I think that kind of boggled his mind. Um, But at the same time, I think when he makes a movie, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't want to make a movie for blood and guts. He doesn't want to make a movie because it's fun. He didn't do it to, get famous or be a star he he feels like cinema um should have something to say and his cinema did and it spoke deeply to so many people um i wanted to ask about uh your the black museum lecture series talk a little bit about that how that got started and uh what's what's that's all about so the black museum lecture series started uh, with myself and Paul Korup, and initially with uh, with the guy who was running the uh, the Rue Morgue podcast, and the idea was that you know horror fans, in addition to loving like to watch horror together, they love to discuss horror, they love to learn about horror, and um, you know Rue Morgue would have these monthly horror movie screenings where we would all watch the movie, and then we would go to a bar and we would have sometimes pretty high level conversations about the movie that we just watched at a bar. And we thought, what if we could, you know, have the director come and talk to us on a high level about these films, and then we could discuss it with them and discuss it with each other. So the Black Museum was primarily a lecture series, but we also did a handful of other events just to get horror fans mixing on a level that wasn't limited to just watching horror movies. Uh, For example, we had a tremendous nightmare tournament. Do you remember that board game nightmare, the VHS board game? Haven't thought about that in a while. uh, Yeah, that's been a minute, but I I do remember. That's crazy. so good. It holds up. Like it is so, so, so much fun. But basically you put on a VHS tape and the game was like an hour and a timer ticked down an hour. And so we had the game, the video uh, uh, projected on a wall at a bar and we had like 10 boards going at once and it was complete insanity. We also did um, the Black Museum debate series uh, I think the first one we did was the best Stephen King adaptation. And I thought, all the teams are going to want to do The Shining, right? We're going to have to throw The Shining out because everyone's going to want to do The Shining. Nobody picked The Shining. The contenders were uh, Carrie, Pet Cemetery, The Mist, and Maximum Overdrive. And guess which one won? Maximum Overdrive. Yeah, Maximum <laughs> Overdrive, I guess. You know. I- it's the most <laughs> it's the most fun adaptation of a Stephen King book. That's what won it. That's what won it. And then we did another debate that was the best sequel. And anyway, uh, great times. I, I'm speaking about it like it's in the past tense, but it's not it, it's not finished. Like we have still been doing some lectures and events um, virtually, but it's not exactly the same. Uh, and also, uh I read that you were a host on Remark TV, uh, which is a YouTube show. Can you talk about that a little bit? What that's 
what that entails. Yeah, Roomorg TV is uh, is is Roomorg's YouTube channel and uh, kind of our foray into this this other form of media that we haven't really tried before. Um, and so, yeah, it's still kind of amorphous, uh, especially under COVID. Right now, we're kind of putting out what we can uh, scrape together under these circumstances. But when we started it out, um, we have a column in the magazine called Versus, which is a horror debate. So sometimes we have videos um, that are kind of like pulled from the pages of Rumor, right? Like we'll have an episode of Versus, which is like a horror debate. Uh, we'll have guest reviews. We had a a, an actual practicing witch come in and talk about Suspiria, for example. We had um, a homicide detective come in and talk about uh, the house that Jack built, stuff like that. Uh, interviews, reviews, plays throughs um, with video games, what have you. Um, I host a show called Absinthe with Andrea, which is just kind of a Q&A, just uh, as editor of the magazine. If people have hot burning questions, I sip disgusting alcohol and answer them. Absinthe is gross. It's categorically gross. Have you guys had it? Uh, no. Unfortunately. I know I'm not preparing it correctly with the, the sugar, sugar and, and, and stuff, but it's just too much trouble. Do you do that <laughs> Q&A live? Do I do it live? No, it's mm. it's like this, you know, like we 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 edit a very casual chat. Pretty cool. Oh, I got I got a question. And, you know, when we we interview people, there's obviously lots of posters in the background. I, I noticed the the posters behind you of the Descent, Cabin Fever and Saw a very I, I love all three for various reasons, but it's a very tight group of like 2003, 2004 horror. What is it about <laughs> those movies? OK, what it is about those movies is this is my spare bedroom and this is this is kind of my streaming <laughs> setup. I, I, I do my Twitch streaming in here and the wall is friggin red and everything looks like crap on this wall. That light that I have, I had to find a light bulb that like didn't look like complete butt. And so, um, you know, those aren't my three favorite movies in the world. I love The Descent. I'll never say anything against The Descent. But uh, those are the three posters that look best on that wall, I'm sorry to say. Um, I live in the Room Org Manor, which is Room Org HQ. And this place is packed with awesome, awesome, awesome posters. Um, so the fact that you guys are noticing that and pointing it out is like killing me a little bit right now. We have a beautiful one of Martin downstairs. We have like Ooh. signed Blair Witch Project and like all the good shit, but this is the garbage. Actually, um, right above that lamp, I don't know if you can see, but that was the poster for my book launch party. You can see it says Night of the oh, Literary nice. Dead. Um, I got Rumorg to sponsor my book launch party. And so that's uh, that's a ghoulish Gary Pullen original before he was freaking famous. Let's see. Okay. So we'll bring us forward to, uh, it looks like 2013. You said you started with Rumorg as a receptionist. How, how did that uh, transition occur to where you started writing articles? Um, I mean, like I said before, Rumorg has such a unique, specific tone. And my writing... You know, I was a good writer, but um, but it but it was stiff. And I think, you know, academics sometimes kind of struggle to um, to make a declarative statement that's unsubstantiated, you know, like you get in the habit of using really cagey language and, uh, uh, you know, just in case I suspect that I will argue that I will demonstrate that. And, 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 and that's not how we write. And so I kind of had to. Uh, I had a tricky time breaking through into writing. Um, I, I remember writing a feature on uh, on The Shining. There was somebody had put out a, a great big book about it, and so I read that and I interviewed the, uh, the the writer, and that was an embedded feature. I started doing some reviews. I started doing some video game reviews, just kind of dipping my toe in. Uh, it's a tricky thing to break into writing at Room Org. And I say that because, you know, I, I've been on both sides of it. We're looking for kind of really specific stuff. And you've got to you've got to sell me on the story, you know, and I think pitching is something that doesn't come naturally to to most people. But it's it's such an important part of being a writer. And uh, I didn't know how to do it. And I think I'm better at it now. <laughs> <laughs> now that I'm in this spot. But uh, yeah, it's not an easy thing to pick up and learn. 
what's a I'm trying to think of how to say this. What's a pitch? Like, what are you looking for when when you have someone coming to you to to present a, a topic? Okay. Well, um, first of all, I I prefer to deal with writers at the pitch stage. I do have a lot of people, uh, like I said, who who pitch me on something that they've already written. Um, mm. And that's often like a passion project for them. They're like, you know, I just love Dario Argento. And so I wrote um, a retrospective on opera. I'd like to submit it for Rue Morgue. The thing with that is, even if it's great and I can use it, the magazine has a limited amount of pages and a limited space. And so my job as editor is, you know, if the cover story is going to be on opera, then I want the secondary to maybe be on a new release. And then I want the third feature to be on maybe a book. Like part of putting the magazine together is making sure that we touch on all the big subjects in horror because it's huge there's so much more to horror than just movies there's books there's video games there's music like there's a whole wide world and Rue Morgue has always you know we've always prided ourselves on really speaking to the culture of the horror fan and exploring horror in all of its incarnations and so a big part of my job is achieving that balance and I think people maybe don't realize that at the pitching stage so I like a pitch because I like to work with the author toward what I want. I like to uh, work with them to understand what it is that they are trying to say with it, uh, what they have at their disposal. I need three things to make a really good uh, feature in Rue Morgue when it comes to a movie. I need a screener of the movie. I need an interview with someone important and I need art. And I need all three of those things. I have had really great stories that I haven't been able to run because there's no art. And Rue Morgue is a beautiful, glossy magazine. Like if you look through the pages, it's not, it's not, well, that's a giant ad. Uh, you know, it's not like a book where there are just words. It is deeply illustrated and that's really important. So, um, so I, I have to have all of those things. And finally, I need to kind of work with the writer in terms of a deadline and a word count. Once I've decided where it is that story is going to go, you know, I don't want to have somebody sending me something that's 3,000 words when I need 600, because uh, that's going to crunch it down and we're all going to get frustrated with that. So I think the best way to pitch to a place like Rue Morgue is to really put forward an idea. Here's what I want to write about. Here's why it matters. Like the so what is is the most important thing to me in terms of, you know, when you think of journalism, you think of like, what is it? The the W's, the who, what, where, when, why. My, my biggest W is who gives a shit. You know what I mean? Like, why do horror fans need to hear this? And why are you the one to tell us? Um, and especially when it comes to pitching a, a pet project like uh, Dario Argento's opera, like that movie has been out for a long time and scholars have been writing about opera forever. What's new? Why does this need to go in the November, December issue of Rue Morgue? What is new to that subject that is happening that is right now? And that's also one of the biggest challenges of the magazine is that, you know, we are talking in late September. I just wrapped up the November, December issue of the magazine. The print world is like light years ahead. So next month I'm going to be looking in my crystal ball to early 2022 and it's not even Halloween yet. So I think that's also something that uh, to keep in mind when you're pitching a publication, like I'm getting tons of pitches right now for new stuff that's dropping on Netflix in a week, but it's already too late. Where do you see Rue Morgue in today's world where you can get everything on the internet right away and you guys are, you know, what, six times a year? So where do you, you know, how do you see Rue Morgue fitting into today's instantaneous news world? Yes, I think, um, I mean, I, I agree with you. I think Rue Morgue does fit into the echelon. And I think being aware of where it fits in has been a big part of, uh, of why we're still around. And I think that tonally, our stories, again, are somewhere between academia. They're as rigorous as an academic piece, but a lot more conversational, a lot more approachable. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're preaching to the choir. You can use terms like Cronenbergian and know that your reader is going to know what you're talking about. You don't have to um, 
explain everything the way you would in academia. But at the same time, it is journalism. So it's not going to be like a blog where you're like, oh, I like this movie because when I was 16, I saw a clown and the clown scared the shit out of me. And like, you have kind of that impartiality that kind of um, elevates the impact of the writing. So that's where we are writing wise. And, you know, in terms of the appearance of the magazine, the physical media-ness of the magazine, I don't think this magazine would survive if it wasn't beautiful. This is something that horror fans want to have and hold and look at and keep and not just read. You know, there has to be a collectability to it. Uh, so we put a lot, a lot of emphasis on having not just art to illustrate our features, but top-notch art, high-resolution art, uh, really beautifully designed by our art director. We've had incredible art directors. All Anyone who's worked as art director for Rumor has gone on to do amazing things with their career. We've had Ghoulish Gary Pullen, obviously, Justin Erickson. Andrew Wright, who is our art director right now, is incredibly talented. And uh, he does a lot of our covers, but we also commission um, artists to do a lot of our covers. And we put a lot of work into making sure that each issue is a collectible in and of itself. And I think that's why we've been able to stay alive in the digital age. Would you say Rue Moore caters, and it sounded like it, would you say Rue Moore caters to more of the, the, the long-term horror fans or the people you want to bring in to, to our world, to the, to the world of genre filmmaking? Um, I mean, a little bit of both, I'd say. Uh, I, our, our readership, our subscribership does skew a little bit older. And I think that, you know, for someone to identify as a horror fan, it takes a couple of years of training. You know, you got to you got to go through the ropes. You got to you got to go through that uh, imaginary checklist I was talking about a little earlier. And um, and if you're still into it after that, then maybe you're going to start checking out institutions like Rue Morgue. I never want to be so insular with our tone and language that it feels like a clubhouse or a boys club or or, or something inaccessible or, or something too cliquey and in-groupy. Um, I've actually felt that way about uh, about some blogs and some podcasts and I'm listening and I'm like, I'm not one of you. I'm not among you. I don't feel embraced by you. And so, and so, I want room org readers to feel like there is room for everyone at the table. And, uh, and I make an effort to bring a lot of voices out and a lot of different perspectives such that even if you don't agree with the writer, well, they articulated their opinion. Well, you may have already covered some of these points, but upon assuming the executive editor uh, position, what, what were some changes you, you wanted to make? Well, it's funny you should ask because uh, the 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 president of Room Org said, you know, I, I'd love to hear your ideas for the magazine, and uh, and I was like, all right, and so I, I had a book, I had a notebook where I just kind of brainstormed some ideas. One of them was uh, the versus column, which is a column at the back of the issue, and you know, the back page of a magazine is always just kind of the fun page. It's always kind of like toilet reads and you can see that we've got it separated and uh and basically we ask a really contentious horror question and we we allow our writers to battle it out and then the readers get to vote on it uh online so i thought that would be fun because you know god knows horror fans are always fighting about the same goddamn shit after so many years and it's like let's uh Let's have the final word on a couple of things, shall we? Lovecraft or Poe, whose writings are more mo morbid? That one was a banger on social media. It was a great conversation. And I don't think the um, the winner who... Oh, the winner is the next issue. We don't know the winner yet. But uh, but yeah, like it, it really gets tongues wagging and, uh, and I feel like it reflects the lived reality of the horror fan. Uh, so that was important to me. I wanted Rue Morgue to start covering podcasts, um, which I realized was uh, was kind of tricky. I understand why we didn't for the longest time because everyone and their dog was coming out with a podcast and then they would do three episodes. And if they didn't have 40,000 listens in the first couple of months, they'd give it up. But, um, but we can't ignore podcasting now. It is such a prevalent form of horror media. So now we review shorts. We review podcasts as well. Uh, what else do we do? 
I brought in Stacy Ponder and I gave her a column and her column is called The Devils in the Details. She's so funny. Hysterical. Uh, you definitely want to check out her podcast. It's called Gaylords of Horror. Um, <laughs> it's a funny title. Maybe you... I, I think I think it uh, it might ill prepare you for how high minded a discussion they have, but uh, but yeah, she's hysterically funny, and so yeah, I wanted to get uh, I wanted to get more voices in there. I wanted to get more women writing, um, some younger writers, some younger artists, uh, just shake things up a bit. What would you say has been your biggest accomplishment at Rumorg? Um, Jeepers, my biggest <laughs> accomplishment, uh, interviewing Clive Barker for a cover story was pretty great. Um, I like, I, that might just be a, a really personal little, uh, fangirl thing. <laughs> Maybe it wouldn't be an accomplishment to somebody else, but, uh, but that was definitely a big feather in my cap. Um, uh, I, I, I made William Friedkin angry when I was interviewing him once before and he raised his voice at me and I was like, Oh God, the guy who directed the exorcist just fucking yelled at me. That's pretty cool. That was a cool accomplishment. Um, I had lunch with Mick Garris sometime. Yeah, like perks are what fuel the fan in you, right? Like, uh, mm. you know, there's the job that you're paid to do. And then there's the job that your heart that makes your heart sing, you know? And so getting to meet Guillermo del Toro and uh, yeah, Stuff like that, it's, uh, it's pretty special. Um, I, I'm quite proud of the uh, queer issue of Rue Morgue magazine. I think that was the summer of, of, of 2018. I knew I wanted to do a queer issue of Rue Morgue magazine. Queer horror was a subject that was that that was bubbling up, but um, but nobody was really talking about it in a, in a in a cohesive way. Like people were kind of rereading, excuse me, films like. Uh, Obviously, Nightmare on Elm Street 2 was the biggest one. And when that documentary came out and the documentary Scream Queen, My Nightmare on Elm Street came out, I was like, this is it. This is this is the catalyst. And so that was the cover story of my queer issue. Uh, I had a feature on the Boulay Brothers and Dragula. And um, and so that one, I was I was really proud of that one. I felt like that was uh, that was something nobody had done before. And, you know, when you're making magazines and like the editors before me put out tons and tons of magazines, nobody's trying to upstage everybody. But I, I thought that that kind of uh, put Rue Morgue up a peg. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about your, I know No Day is probably the same in your, in your world, but just kind of behind the scenes, your day-to-day -day, uh, operations, are you, you know, or do you kind of a nine to five schedule or how, what does that look like a typical day for you? Well, um, you know, I think for most of us who in, in North America, you know, like went to school and then went to high school and then like you're used to having your day really, really structured and being editor of room org, I think was the first time in my life where it was like, this is your job that you have to do and you just have to do it. And I don't have to do it between a certain number of hours and I don't have to do it a certain, like um, the job really ebbs and flows. And because we have a production schedule that I need to spend some time um, dreaming, thinking, imagining, um, looking for inspiration. And you know, you know what inspiration is like, the harder you look for it. You can't find it. And sometimes that means, you know, walking my dog around the block. Sometimes that means doing a jigsaw puzzle. Sometimes that means doing yoga or something. And uh, and then you kind of conceive of like the pieces start coming together. And then it's only toward the end of the production cycle that I feel like I'm really working in the traditional sense where I am um, nagging writers for deadlines, uh, actually doing editing. Um, nagging PR people for, for that trifecta I mentioned before, the art and the screeners and stuff. The correspondence kind of becomes um, becomes more into it. And then toward the very end of production schedule, it's a lot of proofing and reading, and those are the late nights. And so, you know, at this point, about five years into this gig, I, I'm aware of that ebb and flow, and I kind of know what to do. Um, 
But yeah, sometimes my eyes pop open at 7 a.m. and you look at the clock and it's like, oh, I got to get to work. It's like, it's not that kind of job. It's really not. Where do you see the future of Rumor going? I mean, I'm steadying the ship and uh, and as long as people are reading us and as long as people are listening to us, as long as Rumor remains like a trusted institution in this genre, I think... Uh, I, th I think we'll keep doing what we do. I think it would be a mistake to try to um, abandon the magazine. Like we're not, we're not a nostalgia brand. Let's say I like we're we're never going to go fully digital, and we're never going to uh, you know branch out into something that's not us. I think we have a, a very clear idea of our identity and our role, and um, yeah, we're just going to keep sticking on that course and you know horror is always evolving i don't think i don't think it would have been reasonable to conceive of a queer issue uh 20 years ago the magazine itself is only 24 years old but uh the horror discourse is is always changing and the story is always changing the fandom's always changing the internet has definitely made our job more difficult but it's also you know pushed us to innovate and and come up with different reasons why somebody would want to hold something in their hand and I, I think whatever life throws at us be it a pandemic we can handle it Emergency. You are the team to the emergency station.